I'm Dr. David Pruff. I'm a principal investigator and lecturer in neuroscience at the University of Manchester. And today I'm answering questions on brain disease. First question we have, patients with Alzheimer's and some other forms of dementia seem to have a buildup of protein fibrils, tangles and plaques in the brain. Could we cure the disease by simply dissolving those lumps, much like we dissolve blood clots that cause strokes and heart attacks, or are the brain cells damaged beyond repair? Well, certainly there are attempts to uh, develop drugs that target uh, these clumps of protein. And there's a big debate in the field currently as to whether these clumps actually cause brain disease or whether they're a consequence of the disease. However, these treatments are still experimental and they haven't really been tested clinically. Clinically, treatments for diseases caused by uh, lumps of protein, such as dementia, such as Alzheimer's disease, the, the treatments for these are mainly symptomatic. They don't actually treat the cause. So whilst it's possible that we, these treatments could become a reality, it's still early days. Another uh, cause of the disease that we're discovering more about is the immune system. So the immune system is really beneficial and protective. However, during brain diseases such as Alzheimer's disease or such as stroke, the immune system can attack the brain and make the injury worse. Here in Manchester, we're actually trying to target this and we, part of the immune system called the inflammatory response, we know contributes to make disease worse. And we know this in models of Alzheimer's disease and in models of stroke. And by targeting specific points of the inflammatory response, we think we can modify disease to improve outcome. And th that's something that we're currently developing. So it may be that uh, treat new treatments that become available that dissolve lumps of protein could be used in combination with treatments that modulate inflammatory responses to really provide effective treatments. But that's for the future. So the second question we have is how far away from a brain transplant do you think we are? So my own opinion on this is that we're, we are actually some distance away from this happening. I think experimentally people have made attempts to achieve this. There was a scientist, uh, a, an American scientist who tried to transplant the brain of a monkey onto the neck of another monkey. However, the monkey's immune system rejected this and the animal died within a few days. However, even if we could overcome the, the incompatibility of immune responses, there are also other problems, such as reconnecting all the nerves to make this possible. So I think it's still very experimental. However, things are only unfeasible or experimental until somebody actually achieves it. Uh, and these are breakthroughs. And this is what we do in science, is to try and make these breakthroughs. There was a case earlier this year for an, an Italian neurosurgeon actually claimed he wanted to do a brain transplant and he wanted to achieve this by early 2017. Now he has been harshly criticised by fellow neurosurgeons so whether this will actually happen or whether it's um, even feasible is yet to be seen. There's also a large ethical debate to be had here and I don't think this has occurred yet but who would actually be eligible to have a brain transplant? Clearly somebody with multiple organ failure. Uh, this would, for medical reasons, this would be the case. Um, but where do you draw the line? And I, I don't think this debate's been had yet. So in my opinion, we're still some way away from, from this being a reality. So next question, do brain training games have any useful impact on our brain health? Well, I think this is a really interesting question. Um, Currently, there's not enough scientific evidence to suggest that they are beneficial. However, there is a consensus, there is a, of opinion that early educational achievement in life or, or social or work stimulation creates a cognitive reserve that can offset or delay or protect against neurodegenerative diseases and dementias. So there's some, there's some credibility to the theory that actually training your brain or the stimulation could be beneficial. So it could well be a case of either you, lose, you use it or you lose it. So, so whilst there is a good rationale for this, I think currently there isn't enough scientific evidence yet to say that brain training games are useful. So the final question is what lifestyle choices lower the risk of brain disease? 
So the best lifestyle choices you can have for, for promoting a healthy brain are, are the same as you would use for promoting a healthy heart. So a healthy diet, a regular exercise, not smoking, not drinking excessively, managing conditions such as diabetes or depression, these will all be really beneficial. Something we're particularly interested in Manchester as a dietary requirement um, is the nutrient sink. We know, we've shown previously that if you're zinc deficient, you have an overactivated immune system. And we think that people who suffer zinc deficiency, and there are lots of people, two billion people worldwide suffer from this, this could interact to modify diseases of the brain. And this is something we're investigating currently. So in addition to the anti-inflammatory treatments I've mentioned previously in an answer to a previous question, modifying your diet to ensure adequate supply of nutrients could also modify brain health. The thing about cloning is that it's exorbitantly expensive. It's exorbitantly wasteful as well in terms of resources for kind of you only will maybe get a few sand caps. So in terms of efficiency, I mean, conservation is a really cast sort of area to be in anyway. So in terms of efficiency, that's not a very, it's not the best way to be investing your money. So you could, you could put that money towards, say, habitat protection and it would go a lot further.